Welcome to part four of the 2020 National Weather Service Milwaukee Sullivan Storm Spotter Training. For this section, we start talking about what kind of severe weather you can observe and report to us. In this first part, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, hail, flooding, heavy rainfall, and winds. And in the second section, we'll talk a little bit more about tornadoes, funnel clouds, and wall clouds. But these are all the main things that we need to know about. There are some things that we do not need to know about or be reported. Uh, light rain is one of the main ones that we get a lot of reports on. There is a group that you can sign up for called Coco Raz, which we'll talk about in a bit, about how you can report rainfall. Shelf clouds, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about in a little bit, as well as lightning, heavy thunder, things like that. We have sensors that can tell us where lightning is occurring, so we, we're able to monitor that, so no need to report lightning to us. For thunderstorms, there's three main ingredients that we look at when we try to forecast whether or not storms are going to occur. The first is moisture. However much moisture you have may limit how many storms you may actually get and how much rain is produced from those thunderstorms. Instability, how fast is an air parcel going to move upwards when it gets forced up? So we look at how fast the thunderstorm might occur. So the higher the instability, the faster those storms may occur. And then lift something that causes the storms to initially develop and start that rising motion uh, to create the thunderstorms. The bonus ingredient that we look at for severe thunderstorms and how storms become organized is called wind shear. We look at the winds as they go from the bottom of the thunderstorm all the way through the top of it and when they're either increasing or the direction is changing in a favorable, favorable way you can get different types of thunderstorms to occur which may produce different types of severe weather. When it comes to storm types, it all depends on that wind shear that we just talked about. So the less amount of wind shear that you have, the more likely it is that you're going to have something like a single cell thunderstorm that occurs where you have less chances of severe weather. You might have a brief bit of small hail or maybe some gusty winds that occur, but typically not a whole lot of severe weather on those types of days. As that wind shear increases, we have uh, different types of storms that start to occur, like the multi-cell clusters or lines of storms. And when these occur, you might have uh, damaging winds or large hail, sometimes some tornadoes. But uh, this is our most common type of severe weather type that we get in Wisconsin. The highest end is supercell thunderstorms. So on these days, you can have long track tornadoes, some of the largest hailstones uh, that have hit in Wisconsin and across the United States. So on these days when that wind shear is very well balanced that you can get these types of storms to occur, it's our highest end threat for the severe weather that we can get. So from these storms, we have different types of severe weather that occurs. Hail is probably one of the easiest ones to be able to uh, document and send in a report on. All you got to do is measure the biggest hailstone at its diameter, so across uh, the, the hailstone at its widest part, and send that in. A lot of people have some pictures here where they nicely took a picture of the hailstone and then put the ruler right next to it. If you do not have a ruler, a quarter is a good object to put next to it. If anything is bigger than that quarter, then that would be considered a severe hailstone. So you can use different objects as well to, to measure it. But uh, in general, just using a ruler is best. This is, if you do not have a ruler, our general chart for how big a hailstone is. So if you have a golf ball around and the hailstone is comparable to that, you know that you have almost a two inch diameter hailstone that's, that's nearby you. So any of these other types of uh, hailstones uh, can be used to describe what, what you have. One of the things to be considered of is uh, the difference between quarter-sized hail and a quarter-inch hailstone. So most people will get the pea-sized quarter-inch hailstone, um, but just distinguish between that and our severe threshold, which is a quarter, or the size of a coin. With flooding, to be able to report this, uh, some of the main things that you can send in are just roads that are closed or impassable things that have been washed out, roads, bridges, railroads, 
if rivers and creeks are out of their banks, not just the normal standing puddle of water that might occur on streets, which really isn't too big of an issue. Um, if it's stuff like, I've never seen it this bad before, or it's never reached this area, what kind of things are being threatened by the water moving through, and, and what are those impacts? Generally, um, the when we start getting interested in rainfall amounts, it would have to be at least an inch of rain per hour for at least uh, 30 minutes plus. Anything lower than that, generally you're not going to get flash flooding from it. When it comes to reporting heavy rainfall, Kokoraz is the best way to be able to do this. You can... Uh, it's a great program where you can sign up and measure rainfall on a daily basis. We're always looking for new people to, to join and sign this. Uh, what you have is your own rain gauge that you have to purchase, which is generally, I think, about $35 to $40. Uh, but it's a high-quality plastic rain gauge, which you can use to um, be able to, to measure how much rainfall is occurring there. There's an app you can use just once a day. Go out and measure your rainfall and report that in. And that information gets used daily by us and the river forecast centers to gauge how much water is going into our area rivers. When it comes to safety and flash flooding, we have a slogan that we say, turn around, don't drown. It only takes about two feet of water to lift your car or truck up. This uh, gentleman here back in Watertown from August 2018 tried to drive through this flooded viaduct here and as soon as he got a little bit into this water here his car lost contact with the ground and uh, it flooded. He was very lucky. Uh, first responders were on site very quickly from Watertown and they were able to rescue him from his car before it submerged in the water there. The next thing that can be reported to us or observed is damaging winds. This is the most likely type of severe weather that uh, you'll see on a particularly on a yearly basis. Um, it's the most common type of severe weather that we get in Wisconsin. Last year we had the biggest severe weather event came through northern Wisconsin on July 19th and this wiped out forests of trees with 80 to 100 mile per hour winds over quite, quite a decent area up there. When it comes to damaging winds, know that most people tend to overestimate how fast those winds were. So, um, but you are more likely to be able to report something along these lines. So when it comes to doing that, we have some kind of general estimates you can do, which we'll talk about in the next slide. But when it also comes to trees, talk a little bit about what the actual damage is to the trees. Is it a full tree that's been uprooted? Is it multiple trees? Is it one rotted tree that went down? Um, or is it branches, one branch, two branches? How thick was it? Those kinds of things. One other thing to know is that you can get the strongest winds out ahead of the rain as opposed to when it actually occurs. So uh, you can get those strong winds out ahead of it. Now when it comes to estimating winds, we have uh, different kind of guidelines for how fast the winds are going. Generally in the 30 to 50 mile per hour range, you have the whole trees in motion. You can have some small twigs or small branches breaking out of the trees, but generally you're not going to get trees uprooted or uh, widespread damage from a situation like that. Maybe as it's getting closer to 50, you're getting a little bit more damage, uh, but in general, these would be considered non-severe winds. Getting closer to our threshold for severe thunderstorms with damaging winds, uh, 50 to 58, you're starting to see more branches and smaller limbs coming out of the trees, uh, but maybe nothing that's you know fully blocking roads and things like that. So our severe thunderstorm wind threshold is 58 miles per hour. When you get above that, you're starting to see some kind of structural damage, uh, maybe some larger branches getting broken and taken out of trees, um, multiple branches coming out of those trees as well. And then going anything above that, you're looking at loss of uh, roofing materials, uh, trees getting uprooted, trunks snapped, those kinds of things. So higher end type damage, much more widespread as well to be able to hit that threshold. So when it comes to damaging winds, uh, safety wise, the people that are most vulnerable from this are campers or anybody boating. Uh, we had these, these winds up north. Uh, this was a Boy Scout camp that uh, thankfully everybody was inside the main 
facility there uh, when these storms came through. Otherwise, there were numerous tents that had trees that landed on them that uh, could have hurt or killed some of these kids that were out camping. So uh, if you're in that situation, you have to be a little bit more aware of your scenario and how bad it potentially could be. One of the cloud features that we typically see with uh, a line of storms is a shelf cloud. We have no way to really identify how fast the wind speeds are with a shelf cloud. You can, you can get these on non-severe thunderstorms. You can get them on severe thunderstorms. But essentially, these are the leading edge of the wind shift uh, for where the storms are moving in. So it's a long-lasting cloud on the horizon that you can watch this go across. But uh, in terms of shelf clouds, you don't need to report it. You can take a picture of it because it looks fairly ominous. Um, but we can't get a gauge on how bad the scenario is just off of this cloud occurring. 